Yes. Good. Yes. Um, we have guest speakers who are on different topic joining the call around 8.15. So I do want to sort of get started. Um, and I, I know we're waiting for about three more of our committee members, but they could just um, join in, I guess, when they when they get here. Um, but just, I just want to introduce um, to our committee that um, our new uh, two new village planners are on the call in case people don't know them. So William Long, you wanna say hi, William? William, you're Hello, on. Hello, William. I'm William Long, I'm the uh, director of planning. Um, let's see, uh, I have, uh, prior to this, I was working with the uh, city of Mount Vernon for the past 11 and a half years. And, um, you know, I'm excited and uh, looking forward to uh, working with the village and getting, you know, more acquainted with the village. Great. Well, welcome. We're looking welcome. forward to working with you. Thank you. And then we have Amber Nowak, also um, recently joining us from the city. Hi. 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 Yes, uh, Nowak. Um, Amber Nowak. Uh, I was previously with the New York City Department of City Planning. Um, prior to that, I was with the Landmarks Preservation Commission of New York City. And I have my master's in urban planning um, at the U. Uh, so I, I just started uh, a couple of weeks ago. This is my third week with the village. So I'm still getting integrated, but um, I'll be taking on some of uh, the responsibilities regarding this particular committee that um, Robert had uh, had, had um, as part of my, uh, as part of our, our team's um, responsibilities. Great, okay. So, um... I don't want to spend a lot of time in introductions, but if people just want to quickly say your name and then I'll introduce following our guest speakers because there's more to say for them. <laughs> but I'm just wondering, wasn't Jerry supposed to be on the call? Do you know Amber or? I don't know that Jerry's going to be able to make it tonight. That's unfortunate, okay. All right, um, so Michelle and Ron, you know me, Ellen Silver. Um, everyone just want to say hello? Renee? I'll just introduce everyone. We have Renee Crabtree. We have Dan sure. Natchez. Who I'm is trying our, to unmute myself. Hi. Um, we have Dan Natchez who is, sits on our board. He's one of the board um, of trustees for the village of Amaranek. He's our board liaison. Uh, Tim Whitney, David Freeman, Liam Rob O'Hagan, Christy Young, and Martin Hain. Hi, we met last night. <laughs> <laughs> and Maria Carso. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Uh, so, so Ron and Michelle, um, Michelle Sterling and Ron Schulhoff, um, I've known you guys now for a few years and they, they live and work um, in Scarsdale. They're like, you know, the uber <laughs> environmentalists of, of Scarsdale and now of the county really. And so thank you so much for being here. Um, our food um, waste program was modeled off of what they did in Scarsdale. We sort of just took it out of their playbook and, and brought it here. And I asked them to come tonight because, you know, we, we have this conversation over and over of how we could increase our penetration and our program and how we could do better community outreach. Um, I'm sorry, I just saw David Styler just joined the call. Hi, David. Um, so over the last, so I'm just gonna read a little bit of their bio just to give it a little more formality. Um, but over the last several years, Michelle and Ron have been instrumental in launching sustainability initiatives throughout Scarsdale and Westchester County. Together, they've helped all seven Scarsdale schools, a number of houses of worship and Scarsdale Village launch food scrap recycling and zero waste programs. Their efforts have made a tremendous impact within the Scarsdale community as well as throughout Westchester, as other, as well as other municipalities, schools, and organizations have come to Scarsdale to learn and launch their own zero waste programs, as the village of Maranek has done. Um, in addition to zero waste programs, Michelle and Ron have worked on a number of other successful sustainability initiatives in Scarsdale, such as LED streetlight conversion project, furniture donation, the Take It or Leave It Shed the textile recycling, recycling education and expansion, updating Scarsdale tree code, 
creating a solar code which streams, streamlines the solar application approval process for residents and the electrification of the Scarsdale Village fleet. Michelle and Ron have also worked with Westchester County to create a county food scrap recycling program which supports existing municipal food scrap recycling programs, as well as help new municipalities in the county start food scrap recycling programs. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to them. Just, you guys could tell us a little bit, you know, about your trajectory of what, you know, how you started, where you are now. Um, and I think the unique thing about Scarsdale is that you guys actually have curbside pickup, municipal curbside pickup. Um, so we'd love to hear how that came about and how that's working. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still getting emails from a member of ours that he can't get on the call. I don't know why, but um, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Ron and Michelle now. Thank you. Just really quick, who, which, uh, which member is having the issue? Dan Kushnick. Uh, there is a person in the waiting room whose name is just Dan, D-A-N. Would that be him, possibly? I, Can I bring I, him in? I couldn't tell you. Sure, bring him in. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully it's not some random Dan. <laughs> you can always boot him out again. Uh, Dan, please unmute yourself. I'm, I'm here. I was, I was listening to the call. I just couldn't get uh, the camera. I wasn't here. Okay, in. well, we're glad that you're able to join us now. Hi, thank yeah, you. I'm here. Thank you. Okay, so hey, I'm just really to... quick, just really quick. One other thing, there's another person in the waiting room, uh, a Mackenzie. Is that a person? Oh, Mackenzie, please, yes, Mackenzie, yes, please let okay. her in. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, Madam Chair. Hi, Mackenzie. Okay. Hi. Thanks so much for letting me be here. Absolutely. So I'll just um, introduce you quickly because um, we're about to get started with our guest speaker. So Mackenzie is an amazing Mamaroneck High School um, senior and a, a staunch environmentalist. And she's interested in helping us in um, with the, our food waste program. Um, so I invited her to be a flyer on our wall tonight. Thank you. Okay, so I'm turning it over to Ron and Michelle. Well, th thank you for having us. Uh, we always love coming to our neighbors and talking about food scrap recycling. Michelle and I, we like talking about anything sustainability, but love talking about getting food scraps out of the waste stream and turned into compost. Um, we, we're happy to talk about really any topic or answer any questions. So please feel free as we go, just uh, we can have, let's make this a dialogue, whatever works for everybody on this call. Um, we thought we would briefly touch about the county program, because you may have heard about that and how that's relevant um, to each municipality, including Mamaroneck. Um, and also talking about outreach, um, especially during uh, this time, where it's a little different than how we would normally do outreach. Um, and then really any other questions. Um, so let me see if Michelle has anything else to add. And then I was tasked with starting with the county stuff. Yes, no, that's great. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm just gonna go on mute while Ron's talking and we'll just switch off. Um, so just very briefly, so everybody is aware of what is happening at the county level. So up until this point, um, Scarsdale, we were the first municipality to launch a food scrap recycling program. Uh, that was back in January 2017. Since that time, over about half the county municipalities have launched their own individual programs. So there are about 21 municipalities now that have food scrap recycling programs in place. There are a number that are preparing to launch, but we've all been doing it ourselves. Uh, Michelle and I have helped all these municipalities and we've shared all the materials and the, everything that all the, the bins and the starter kits, but every municipality has had to go out and essentially do their own contract with a hauler. Um, and we don't necessarily get the economies of scale that you would get when you bring in the county. And you know, one of the main reasons of having a county level of government. So since we all did this though, uh, Michelle and I have been working with Westchester County and George Latimer and his team on what could the county do to support these programs. Um, there are a few different things happening. There, there are three things at the county level. The first is what we'll really talk about tonight, which is a program to make it cheaper for municipalities to launch and implement and run these programs. The second is a little bit around education. 
And then the third is more longer term on handling all this material locally so we can all get the compost back within Westchester. Now that's a, a little bit longer term, so we won't talk about that too much tonight, but just wanted everybody to be aware that we're thinking not just about this year or next year, but really long term, what does food scrap recycling look like throughout Westchester? The piece that is most relevant um, for this discussion, I mean, I'll just give a brief overview and then if anybody has any questions, is that up until now, every town or municipality has gone to a hauler to bring their food scraps to. And that hauler aggregates it and then brings it to a commercial compost facility. The county, uh, should be any day now, will be sending out an, what's called an IMA, it's an intermunicipal agreement, for municipalities to join where they, the county, will contract with the hauler. And then each indiv individual municipality will be able to go through the county at a much more reduced cost to get, to get rid of and haul the food scraps. So nothing will change operationally for your program. It will be the same. It'll actually be taking it to the same place that you're taking it now. The only difference is that it will be logistically easier and much cheaper to do. So this is a huge win. This is a taking our economies of scale of everybody doing this and making this better for everybody. So you guys were a leader in getting this program started when it wasn't always you know, as easy to do. And now we're starting to see all those benefits. So that was a lot. I just wanna pause there, see if either Michelle has anything to add or if there are any questions about that and how that impacts your program. So Ron, that that's happening sort of now, right? In October? That program, uh, the documentation should be coming out any day to the municipalities. And then each municipality would, in, and, and I, IMAs are very common. There are IMAs for trash and recycling and all sorts of things. So this is a very common structure for your, your municipality. Um, you would engage that with Westchester County. Once you, um, sign up for that, it would just switch over to this program. But really nothing would change in your day to day. Okay. Um, and, so and the reason why that is, Ellen, is because the county engaged, the county put out a bid with a whole bunch of carding companies to take the food scraps. And the company that won the bid is Suburban Company, because Suburban Carding, yeah. which happens to be the exact same carding company that you guys are using right now to take your food scraps. So that's why logistically there will be no change whatsoever for Village of Marinex, and it'll just be like incredibly smooth because you're just going to be doing, like Ron said, the same exact thing, but paying a fraction of the price. So it's great. Yeah, that's great. Christine? You're muted. I was simply approving of it because because uh, the I know the hauling has been the biggest the big issue and you know the weight and the cost and then I'm just I'm pleased to see that we're combining our efforts and making it more efficient. Yeah, it's going to be a fraction of the cost now. It's actually going to be half the cost of trash. So there you're really you could be really motivated as a community to take the food scraps now in terms of like your pitch to take the food scraps out of the trash. It's not only the right thing to do by the environment but you're actually saving, you'll be saving money when you do it. Well, I, I already hear people saying, well, so will I get a, a break on my taxes? <laughs> I can already imagine hearing that, which I doubt the answer is yes, but be nice. You won't get a break on your taxes, but you know, what you will get is, you know, we will be moving forward towards eventually a local solution for to have a composting facility in Westchester County. And once we have that, we can start getting compost back and really reap the benefits, but that's like five, 10 years out. Yeah. Has, has anybody run the numbers as to what the savings are for the village under this new program? So it's very simple. Right now the village is paying $29 and change. So let's say $30 a ton for trash. And under this program, you'll be paying for the food scraps, $15 a ton. So there it is. times the number of tons. Correct, yeah. Wow, okay, that's really good to know. Yeah. So guys, can you talk a little bit about 
how you were able to get Scarsdale Village to do curbside pickup and if in doing that it eliminated a garbage day or, and how and really the nuts and bolts of how that works would be really helpful to hear. Sure. Ron, do you want to, want to start or do you want me to start? Yeah, so we the order we should go in is first we should talk about outreach because that is what then led to the natural progression of moving towards curbside. So just so everybody's aware, the history of the program in Scarsdale is the same as here in, in the village of Marinick. We started with a drop-off site and um, every town that started starts with a drop-off site. It wasn't until then sometime later where we had a program at a certain scale that we said, okay, now let's start to look at curbside. So from a order of operation, let's talk about outreach um, and then we can talk about that. I'll leave, hand that over to Michelle. So, you know, in a normal, just, just to go on to outreach, um, you know, so there's sort of normal outreach strategy and then there's COVID. So I think we're just for this, we're just gonna, we, we got your sheet about what you guys do normally and it sounds great. I think for this, maybe we should just focus on um, over this next, you know, rest of 2020, most likely, what are the best things that can be done in terms of, of outreach? Does that sound good? Yeah. Um, so one of the, th so obviously outreach that's being done outdoors, you can do it with, with a mask. Um, so, you know, normally we do a lot of indoor programs. So we'll do like a zero waste program at a church or a synagogue, but the indoor programs aren't really happening now. So in terms of outdoor programs, one of the things that we thought of, and we're just going to go to, you know, concrete things that really relate pertain to your community. Obviously, I don't know if you guys still have the farmer's market. I know there's an indoor farmer's market, but is there an outdoor one that's happening there? That's a question. There's an outdoor one in Larchmont, not in, in Mimarinac. Not in Mimarinac. He, he, hosts, okay. he hosts the winter one. You host the winter one. Got it. Um, you know, but one Ellen, of the things that know, we thought of. Will the indoor one be running? You know, so. I, Dan Natchez, do you know the answer to that? Because I'm not really sure. Dan? I'm trying to work the computer. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the answer is we don't know yet. Okay. Uh, the, it, a lot depends on what the edicts are from the governor, but the probability is at the moment, no. Okay. Yeah, it was in a pretty small space last year. And, and that's that's part of the issue. You can't have, the space doesn't allow social distancing unless you don't have, you know, only maybe 10% of the providers, you know, so it, it, it gets to be a cat 22, but I don't know the answer yet there. I know they're looking at it. Okay. Okay. But, 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 but I do have a question for Ron now that I figured out how to unmute myself. If I back just a minute, um, you know, if these carding is holding the, um, the food overnight, no. overnight, no. they, they will bring it straight up. Say, say again. They, they will not be holding it. It goes to the, straight to the compost facility. Okay, because uh, there, there are issues with suburban carting and legal issues and planning. I don't know if uh, uh, in neighborhood issues that uh, from when they were restricted to non non food uh, operations. Uh, yeah, and and. Um, Operationally for Suburban, because they've been doing this for the last several years, nothing will change operationally for them. So they've been doing the food waste hauling and they'll just continue under their existing operations to do okay, it. Okay, thank you, that's that's helpful to know. Um, so just to go on to outreach, um, one of the locations we thought would be great would be right at your recycling center. Um, and what, you know, because you do have people going in there and it really is all village of Mimaranek residents, they're going there anyway. Um, what we always like to do is we like to set up, I know we were going to do some outreach with you at one of your events, but everything got canceled. Um, but one of the things that we like to do is we like to set up a pyramid of kits and, you know, have a volunteer or two there for a few hours on a Saturday. Generally, the Saturdays are the busiest days. Um, we like to do, you know, at least one or two outreach events a month, um, and so that's that's one of the um, 
one of the main places we thought you could really get, you know, some really good traction. Um, in terms of, you know, so the other thing that you could do is obviously you have your banners up, but we also wanted to talk to you about, you know, your social media presence. Um, in the beginning, we used to, um, we used to post weight tickets, how much we were collecting, and we would show the community, you know, how we're going up. Um, basically, we had like almost every week, sometimes twice a week, we would post these sort of motivational posts on social media um, for in, in the Scarsdale centric groups, trying to get people um, and at the end of every motivational post sort of like what the benefit is to the environment or how great we did this week or something about sales or highlighting a person that was new to it that it really you know changed their outlook. And then what we would do, would, we would say, you know, at the end, like want in, and we'd say email composting at scarzo.com. So there's sort of no, been no silver bullet for us. We get, you know, we get from the live events, from social media, from the banners, from emails, um, pretty consistent letters to the paper. We're sort of always getting, you know, let's say three, four, five signups a week, which, you know, over 52 weeks, it really does, you know, build up. Um, the other, I'm just going to pause there on just sort of our main tactics that, you know, things that you can do during COVID. Um, and then I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about the pitch. Now, if I'm being redundant or you've already tried all these things or, um, you know, you could just cut me off or if I'm getting kind of too remedial. But the next piece would be like how we pitch it. Because really the question for us is how have we gotten such a tremendous amount of signups, right? And um, it's really from being out there um, sort of at, at every piece, at, at village events, um, both you know, in person, um, online, social media, and then also our pitch. So our pitch tends to be a very can positive. Just, can we just pause there for one second before we go to that? Um, how does that sound to folks on the call? Are the, does that, just love to hear back and make it sort of into a dialogue. Well, I'll, I'll get started. Um, I think that I love the idea of um, the social media posts. And I may, after, you know, follow up with you, Michelle, on just some examples because I'm not the most savvy, but I think that we could probably be doing a better job on social media, no doubt. Um, you know, we've, we've certainly put it out there. We have next door. You probably have that in Scarsdale. So we've definitely put things out here and there. Um, but I think we could certainly be doing a much better job with that. We have had um, a lot of tabling events. And I think the village of Mamaronek is maybe a little trickier than the village of Scarsdale because Scarsdale is Scarsdale, right? So, and it's a really big village where we've had a lot of these tabling events. A lot of our first questions are, do you live in the village, even at the farmer's market, do you live in the village of Mamaronek? And the answer often is no, because there's the town of Mamaronek, there's Larchmont, people coming from Rye. So just even that, finding out who our actual residents are. So I, try, I think that social media would maybe help us target more than just having a table out. But if we have something at the actual recycling center, then it would only be a village resident, most likely who would be there. So that's something we haven't done. It's a little, it's not, it's not as spacious as your um, DPW. Um, you guys have a really nice DPW. Ours is like this narrow, whatever, but we could probably do something there. And you know, one of the nice things about the social media part of it is that when you're doing this by yourself at home, you're, you're filling up your bin and then you're bringing it over. But what, when we think about what is the impact we're having, it's not just each of us individually, but when we all talk about what we're doing collectively, and then we talk about the fact that it's not just even our town, it's 20 other towns in Westchester. And then we talk about all the schools and houses of worship and other organizations that are doing this. And all of a sudden you realize the number is huge. Now, sometimes it, it can be hard when you're just putting, you know, you have your, your apple core and you're saying, oh, I just had this little apple core. How is this gonna help? But what, and all credit to Michelle, she does all the social media posting. When she posts, people can then feel part of something much, much larger. And 
one of the time, one of the real values and one of the things that we always hear such positive feedback about this program is that we are empowering people to take an action to do something really beneficial. And so hard, sometimes it's so hard to say, okay, what, what can I do to make a positive impact? And here is something, here is something you can do. And if we all do this together, and we're seeing this around Westchester now, we can all have a huge impact for our community. Totally, and one thing I just wanna say, repeat something that actually Mackenzie, you had said to me on a phone call, which I, it was so uh, like such an awakening and such a great comment, which was uh, Mackenzie lives in Arizona for a while and she, they didn't have this program there. And she was like, what a great opportunity people have here to participate in this program. And I, and I just love that, that, you know, that view on this program. Um, Cause a lot of times when we approach people I feel like a, being a little nudgy, like pestering people. <laughs> the people don't want to be bothered. Um, but uh, anybody else on the committee have any response to what Michelle said? Hey Tim. Well, yeah, I was wondering because I think Robert does put it out there on the village social media, correct? So do you, Michelle, put it out on like the village of Scarsdale site or like individual sites, you know, how does it work? Because I mean, we're getting it out to the village. I mean, Robert posts things, he puts statistics. Um, so basically what I did is I'm like, I'm like a Facebook troller. <laughs> I, what I've been, I, what I've tried to find out are what are all the Scarsdale social media groups that exist? So we, we had initially, a, we do still have a big one. It's called Scarsdale Face, Facebook Scarsdale Moms. And there's like almost 3000 people on it. Um, it. There's moms, but now there's dads too. So there's, that's 3000 Scarsdale residents. Mm -hmm. Then we have a Scarsdale social book, social um, Facebook page. They also have about 2000 people. There's some overlap, but not total. There's a Scarsdale gardeners group. Um, and then I've also built up my Scarsdale profile so that, you know, I have over a thousand because I tend to, whoever likes a post that I make, you know, I friend them so that then they become my friends. And so now I have over a thousand friends. So you can grow your own and you can add other groups. And that's, um, you know, through that I'm hitting, you know, with every post close to 6,000 Scarsdale residents. So um, I think you would just need to explore a little bit um, what are your village of, of Mamaroneck? Now there might, some of them might be combination village of Mamaroneck, Mamaroneck, you know, town of Mamaroneck, large one. But even if you have some, some cross posting, it's okay. You know, you will still get your, I mean, you have, you know, 20, just, you know, 20,000 residents. The town of Mamaroneck and Larchmont also have this program. Right. Yeah. So if you, if you help them get to a sign yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Fine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Now through, through Scarsdale, through the village of Scarsdale, they do have an e-blast that goes out. It goes out um, every two weeks. It's called Scarsdale Official. And it's our sort of, you know, little official email communication, but it's an opt-in communication. So not all of our, we have 18,000 residents, so we're about the same size as you, but it, you know, maybe it has a couple of thousand participants, but we, we also um, put into that but we use that. That's not something we can put in every week. It's not like a magazine. It's just for like news flash. So we, when we hit the 1 million pound mark or when we hit, you know, a household participation mark or certain big mile markers, um, you know, I'll write up a little blurb for that um, and we'll put that in there. Yes. So, so yeah, we, we've picked around the social media and all those different things. And uh, I think one thing that that's sort of come back to us is that, you know, there's no real way for us to track the response rate on that, on that kind of stuff. But one thing that we thought might be helpful or useful would be um, direct mail, like maybe putting something into their, their tax bill or putting something in with you know, the regular recycling mailings that we send out or something like that. Have you guys tried any of that kind of stuff? Yes. Yep. So we've, um, that's a great idea. We have an annual recycling mailer that goes out with the recycling guy, the schedule, and everybody opens that because it has their schedule. Um, and so we have a one pager about that and we'll just give it to you and you can just change it and um, 
change the wording on it. Um, but we've been putting that in the last couple of years. Yeah, that, yeah, that'd be great. Cause we, we had talked about doing that. So yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. One thing to touch on is you, you said something that I think is really important. You know, how do you track the, the hit rate? How do you track the metrics? You know, something that Michelle and I have seen doing this years now is you sort of have different uh, interactions with folks. Sometimes somebody will hear about this for, for the first time and say, oh, I didn't know, sign me up right now. Sometimes you'll get somebody that sort of needs some time to process and they'll say, oh, okay, interesting. And they just, they need a day or two days to process it. So it might take a second time. And then there's those, those folks that are resistant at first. And we've had plenty of people be resistant. I have to tell you, some of our most ardent supporters now were the people that were resistant at the beginning. And it maybe took them three, four, five times, but we just kept explaining why and, you know, no pressure, but when you're ready, you know, we're here, let's give it a try. And we've tried to make it really easy for people to just try it. And we find that over time, even those folks end up coming around and giving it a try. And so just as a reminder, as you're whether it's in person or online, it might take more than a few times, but um, just keeping that awareness up, it, you'll see it you know, come back. Yeah, is there is there is there also any any way I mean you know since we're since we're not doing curb pickup there's no way to like influence your neighbors so so to speak by having you know the can at the end of the lane so they can see who's actually participating and who's not participating so you know could we you know maybe put a you know, give a sticker to people that they could put in their window that says you know I am a scrap recycler or something like that or you know, something to, to, you know, sort of blaze in the neighborhood when their neighbor drives by every day and sees that their neighbor, you know, five of their neighbors are, are doing this and they're not the one doing it. Anything of, of that type? <clears throat> so just one thing back on tracking the, the social media, like the hits, um, I always put, and I'll answer that question, but I just want to finish on this. I'm I always sure. put at the bottom of my Facebook posts um, that you can PM me. So you can personal message me through Facebook you can PM me directly, or you can email composting at scarzo.com. And the reason why I always put that on there is because some people would rather just connect like directly with a person. So I really recommend that in when you're posting on social media. And just in terms of tracking, I mean, pretty much every time I post, you know, almost every time I usually get a person reaching out to me, sometimes just to inquire, sometimes to sign up, or sometimes people then email composting and say, you know, I saw your post. So you, you kind of can, you kind of can end up sort of tracking it. I mean, it's not perfect, but you kind of can. Um, I love your idea about, you know, sort of having like something out there. We, um, you know, we've seen that before in the various healthy yards campaigns, you know, people put that those little, instead of the yellow, we've treated our lawn with pesticide sign, they put yeah, out like, like a, a little, a little yeah. butterfly, right? This is a healthy yard. Um, that's something, I think that's a great idea. That's something that you could just get an inexpensive vinyl one and, um, stick it in your lawn. And, you know, this is a, you know, this is a food, you know, we are food scrappers or, you know, with a big apple core in the middle or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's an awesome idea. Michelle, just as yeah. a matter of information in a, in a system where you have municipal pickup, what, what do you do in Scarsdale to sign up? Do you have to sign up? Do you have to, to purchase a kit? Is there a payment system or is it free as long as you have something on your curbside the day of the pickup? Okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll tell you about that. Um, there was one other thing I just wanted to go into on outreach because you, sorry, just while, if, so we can finish on outreach. Um, because you guys have quite a few, we only have three apartment buildings in Scarsdale you guys have more apartment buildings than that. Apartment buildings are a great way to get households to sign up because all you do is you, you park a table outside and as people go in and out the building, so you know it's Village of Mamaroneck residence because it's a Village of Mamaroneck building. Um, we have um, an incredibly high percentage of signups in our, in our three apartment buildings because you know, we just kind of plan ourselves. We used to go indoors in the lobby, but now you didn't, you could just go outside. And um, you just basically, you know, you just give everybody, everybody your pitch. Do you know you can recycle food scraps in Village of Mamaroneck and you hold up your kit and you explain to them how. So 
I think that that's something that you guys could explore if you have a volunteer that's willing to do that, even for, you know, a couple hours on a Saturday. You have all the buildings too on Garth Road there. That's, those are all co-ops. Those are actually all Eastchester Sanitation Department. So oh, they're either a, they're a Scarsdale PO, but they're not Scarsdale schools and they're not Scarsdale sanitation. But we do have a number of apartments, both um, mid-rise and then some garden apartments. And we have many participants in those apartments. Yeah, we do. It works out great. Um, before we touch on the question about the signups, I just, I saw, I think somebody else had a hand up. Was it about outreach? Just to close on outreach. And then we um, will answer that question about how people are signing up. No, it had to do with social media. So um, recently, I, a couple months ago, actually, I converted my Instagram account to an environmental education platform. Now I have made a whole video on food scrapping and how I've implemented it into my household and kind of just trying to persuade people like just to show them how easy it is and how, how good it can be to just like make a habit of it. Um, and how the whole idea just seems kind of, um, like another task to add to your like list of things to do. But, um, I think having a different mindset about it and having it come from me, who's like one of their peers, one of my, like the people I go to school with, like, I want them to see that, like, you know, it's kind of comforting hearing it from me. And, um, obviously people my age, people who are living under um, same roofs as their parents, like they don't have, they may not have a say in, um, in like what, what goes on, you know, like, so I think the whole part is like asking their parents and, um, and kind of just actually getting them to be active. Like I'm trying to get people my age to be like, yeah, we should be doing this. This is a great idea. We and I'm it. wondering, thank you. <laughs> and I'm wondering, um, is there anything that I could do that I could say anything more that could um, get more people on board? Make a, make a food scrap recycling TikTok. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, I've seen a couple of them and like, they're so catchy, especially with the right music. I mean, I know it sounds hokey, but you know, people love videos and music. And you know, to be honest, the more hokey my posts have been, the more, the more, you know, the more fe good feedback I've gotten. You know? We should say that we have um, we have a lot of students that we've noticed who have just signed up their family. Yeah. So I think you should empower your friends to not, well, it's their household, so whatever works best for them, but you know, maybe say, I want to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to go and get the kit or can, you know, let's go together. And I will be, I want to be in charge of it. And we've had a lot of students that have reached out and said, I'm signing my household up. I'm going to get my family to do this. And that would be fantastic. And sometimes it's the whole family that starts and everybody's on board day one. Sometimes it's one person and then everybody else comes along. Uh, but that would be a fantastic way to do outreach. Yeah, you take it on, take it on as as your, as one of your chores, so to speak. You know, and it's like they don't even have to be a part of it. It's just something that you're doing. You know, and eventually they come along. So for the ride, you know. So, but yeah, if you yeah. can encourage your friends to do that, uh, I think that's a great thing. That's a great idea, Ron. We do, I do want to answer David's question about um, just the operations and how people sign up. And just quickly to split it between when we had a drop-off site and you asked about curbside as well. So for our drop-off site, um, you do not have to use a starter kit. Now, 99% of people do. It's just easier. They like the bins. We tested the bins. It's at a great price point, much cheaper than you can get them if you were to buy them somewhere else. Um, if you choose to buy a bin, there were originally um, one of two ways to buy it. One was either through the municipality. And we have two locations where you can buy it at our sanitation department or our village hall. Um, if you only have one place, that's fine too. It's just whatever feasibly works for you. Um, or they could buy it through a volunteer. So Michelle and I would keep some extra kits. If somebody wanted to buy one, um, they would just buy it from us. And we would just help facilitate it 
And actually that's how we got the kids into a lot of people's hands because for some reason, if somebody had to go and get it, maybe it would take them a few weeks to go get. They're just busy and forget. But if they could get that kit right away, they would start right away. So we really focus on making sure to get those kids out to people. Um, and then of course the village has all that information about who is signed up. We would not know if somebody is participating, but just putting their food scraps in a yogurt container and bringing them to the drop off site. I mean, that obviously we would love to know that, but no big deal. Um, you know, if somebody wants to participate and do it that way, that's fine. And that's just, we wouldn't necessarily know they're doing it and that's totally okay. Um, on curbside, it's a little different. Um, it matters more what bin you're using because the, the staff needs to know what bin to pick up. Um, so that you do need to buy the, the village bin for. But for the drop-off site, um, that is there for a convenience. 99% of people use it, but you don't have to use the village bin for the drop-off site. Do you pay for being picked up or is it, is it free if you have the bin outside? It's part of, it's free, it's part of your taxes. Tim, did you have- Are the trucks going to specific, do they have a route and they know the household or they're going all through the town like they would for garbage pickup? There's a food scrap route. Okay. So everybody who wants a pickup, there's an online form. They fill out the online form and then they get added to the route. And, um, and every week, you know, the route grows. Oh. That reminds those, me, I forgot to add like Those people, do they eliminate one garbage pickup that yeah. week? So they still get two garbage pickups. They still get two garbage pickups, yep. Okay. And sorry, David, I, I forgot to say one thing which we added during um, COVID is that you can now purchase the bin online for contactless pickup. So you used to have to go into the office to pick up the bins. Um, obviously, we didn't want to do that. So you can go onto the website. We just use our rec department software because it could already take credit cards. It already had everybody's account info. So you can go online, you can purchase it. The sanitation staff then just put, prints out the invoice, tapes it onto whatever you purchased, whether it's additional bags or the bins and puts it outside the next day for contactless pickup. So that's something we added um, for COVID, but we'll keep that because it's a, people love being able to buy it online. Mm -hmm. Tim, Tim did you have a question? Yeah, I had a, I had a related to this. Um, it's kind of a hybrid of the outreach and this operations. You were saying that you were targeting like three to five signups a week was like a, a good benchmark of, uh, that you're growing at a good rate. Was there a threshold um, like as a percentage of residents or something where it was then it tipped the scales and it made financial sense for Scarsdale to have it, um, you know, be curbside. And um, I'm, I'm curious about that. And then the other part of it was about managing, um, you know, part of, I feel like with social media, a lot of the times when you're doing that posting for outreach, you also become like a um, customer service rep and you're managing kind of like information and education. And so how did you guys handle that? Um, you know, was there a site you always sent people to or a form email that you had ready? Um, how do you manage that part of the outreach side of things too? So I'll, I'll just start Ron and then you can do it. So we have this email address composting at scarsdale.com. So everybody who signs up knows that that's, that's the email address if you have any questions. And uh, we have a joint committee uh, so it's made up of volunteers, Ron and I, resident volunteers. It's our food scrap recycling committee, our superintendent of public works and our foreman. And so in terms of questions like what can go in the bin um, or just questions about bins, bags, what can go in, anything basically about the program, Ron and I answer those questions. And any operational questions like if they're, you know, a bin has a broken latch, I don't know, you know, something like that that would be forwarded to that, something like that, the foreman would get and he would say, okay, I'll take care of it. So we have that, that delineation. In terms of the social media and the fact that I'm you know, so out there on social media as this kind of face of recycling, um, you know, it's great, it, it's a part of my day. I get you know, three, four PMs a day um, asking questions, honestly about food scrap recycling and also about other types of recycling since we are 
we're on our, we chair our town environmental committee together. So we take these questions all the time and I think it's great. And it's, you know, it's just like a question that I just, on my phone, I type an answer back. And, um, and I think it's just part of this whole process and part of our role as, you know, chairing the environmental committee to help people, you know, help people navigate recycling in general, right? Because it's, it is a confusing landscape. So yeah, we, we answer these questions, but it's not like 50 emails a day. It's like two, three, four, and takes, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes max. And to answer your question about curbside. So every municipality is different. There is not a, um, any kind of threshold that, you know, every municipality is just because we have our own services is, is going to be very different. Um, curbside is a big discussion. That's it. That is a, just like a drop off site is a very simple operational change. Curbside is a bigger operational change. Um, that would be a big conversation. Um, and one we wouldn't recommend for right now uh, for two reasons. One is um, we always find it beneficial to build up your base through the drop-off site because then you have all these people that are your champions. They're gonna help get out there. They'll help answer questions for friends. Um, the second piece is, you know, this is a challenging time right now for, for many, many reasons. Um, with for municipalities for lots of reasons. So just wouldn't focus too much on curbside right now. Michelle and I are happy to discuss it some point down the road um, and sort of go through all those logistics, like just like we're doing now for drop off site. Um, but yeah, it's it's a bigger discussion. Well, I think um, the reason I just, I just want to say that um, our next guest speakers I see have arrived in the Zoom call. Hi, hello there. Um, but we're just wrapping up here, so just bear with us. Um, wow. I, I, Michelle, I want to go back to you because I think you were about to sort of go through the pitch, and I think that's really great for us to just hear the Michelle pitch because, you know, we've heard a lot about ideas of how we can go about engaging with people and we understand better the curbside. And by the way, I think you guys know we do have a nonprofit that was set up by Ryanick High School students that do pick up. So it's not done by the village. Um, it's an amazing service. And Martin, I guess it's not much in your neighborhood, but a Saturday morning when I walk my dog, I see these bins all over the place. And it really is nice. And I actually had the experience of a woman coming up to me saying, excuse me, where, you know, is somebody picking that up for you? Like, what is, like, she was like, so that was great. She was inquiring about it. And I love, you know, it just gives me like a little bit of joy on Saturday mornings when I see all the bins out for pickup. Um, yeah, so, yeah, uh, not, not you know, it would be nice if our municipality would take this over, but these kids, they have about 90 households in their program. They're doing a great job. They help sell kits. They, they, they help put, you know, they're a marketing arm for us. So they've been really net net a positive. Um, but I, I want to just maybe keep you guys for another five or 10 minutes, but I really do want to hear the, you know, the pitch, the Michelle sure. pitch. Sure. Um, just the first thing I'll say is when, whenever we table, there's a big difference between passive tabling and active tabling. So like passive tabling is just, you're standing behind the table and the kits are there and you're just kind of hanging out, hoping someone will come up to you. So I would say we, you know, we do, we really don't do any passive tabling um, because it's not that effective. So part of it is you really have to get the right people at that table, people who aren't shy, people who are positive, people who are willing to go up to someone and say, hi, how are you? know, imagine I'm holding a kit and I'm literally going up to you at face level and saying, do you know you can recycle food scraps in the village of Amerinik? This is the bin. You put your food scraps in here and you bring it right here to the recycling center and all of it's gonna get turned into useful compost. And you can help the environment every day in that way. I mean, literally like in your face, in a positive, Six I mean, you can say it's aggressive, right? But it's, it's, it's kind, it's friendly. Right. Uh, um, and I think, um, you know, you don't want to scare people, but I think you really want to let people know what we call it's the what, how, why. And you try and do your what, how, why in like a minute. So the what is what you're doing. We're recycling food scraps. The how is how are we doing it? Putting it in this bin, taking it to the recycling center. And the why is one sentence on, you know, why are we doing this? Well, we're turning it into useful compost. We're returning it in, we're returning it to the earth. Then, you know, if, if somebody's engaged, you could say to them, well, we're living in a closed loop. You know, the, the soil produces food, the food produces 
food scraps and that goes back into soil and that is closed loop living, which is sustainable living. Or somebody could say, well, why can't we just put it down the disposal or put it you know, to the incinerator? You could tell them, you know, well, food's 90% water and we incinerate, no point, you know, you wouldn't incinerate water. So like, however you can connect with people on the why, it's good to sort of get something like that in there. But just to like a one, two minute pitch on the what, how, why, in a positive, you know, kind of forward, active way um, at your tabling event, we've found that to be really effective. And, Michelle and like Ron said, has, some uh, people it takes a couple passes, but you know, most people come around, sorry. And Michelle has um, a video that we'll share with you that's online so that you can see exactly what it looks like. So, you know, we've helped people that are not in Westchester. And so um, she put together a video that we could send to them. With I'd love all to this. see that. And just do you, do you have the bins there? Do people walk away with a bin? Absolutely. You yeah. should absolutely always have your bin right there at the event. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a schlep, but even if you have five and make a pyramid, yeah. you know, and then, and then, you know, you sell out, it's, it's great, but you want to walk away with it. You want to give it, put it right into people's hands and you want to tell them, use it tonight, go home and use it tonight for dinner. Don't leave it in the trunk of your car. <laughs> and also you give them the spiel, you know, and of how it works. Just to something that Tim had mentioned. So, you know, we had talked about sort of, hey, if you get, you know, five people every week or five people every few weeks, you know, what number you'll get to. You never know what a, a, each event will look like, though. Sometimes you're going to have an event and an amazing number of people are going to sign up. And sometimes you have an event and you get a lot of, well, I need to go home and think about it. And that's OK. So the way that Michelle and I often think about it is not necessarily how many people signed up that day. But how many people did we speak to and have, you know, at least a 15 second conversation with? Because as you do this over and over, you're going to recognize those faces. Now it will be a little harder, but you'll recognize those faces. And you'll see that person that you spoke to once or twice before come back and say, now I'm ready. And they'll, they'll remember you. So they'll come up and be like, oh, you spoke to me at this other event, or I was here the other week. Okay, I'm ready to sign up. So um, we really try to think of how many we, people we spoke to at each event. Um, just two more things I want to mention just really quickly about the pitching. For your 300 households that you have signed up, you know, if you have the volunteers to do some reach outs, you know, somehow maybe reach out to them either with a call or an email, ask them how it's going and ask them if they have a friend. You know, I mean, if you think about it, if all of those 300 households could get one person to sign up, that would be very significant. Um, and another thing that we did, which was useful, is we spoke to real estate agents in our community. I don't know if any of your 300 people on there are real estate agents yeah. or if you know any, but, you know, a real estate agent, when you buy a home, they usually give you, you know, a platter, you know, or some sort of housewarming gift. We have our real estate agents give everybody, you know, your $20 food scrap recycling kit, and that's your housewarming. It's like, welcome to the community. We are an environmentally friendly community. You should be so proud to live here. And we have heard great feedback from our real estate agents. I think we have that, a real estate agent on this call. Yes, we I had to guess. Yeah. I see, I see yeah, point. yeah, we've had, people love it. People are like, oh, I mean, some people have heard of it, or if you're new to the community, maybe you haven't. But people are like, oh, that's great. Okay, I'm going to try it. You know, thank you. So we, we've had great, um, great reception of that. That's great. Oh, By the I way, I think that the 300 number is, is, a, is an old number. We're, we're beyond that now, but I don't have a firm count. Yeah. Would we even have contact information for them to be able to follow up? Or we, no? have, we do. We used to um, get email. Yeah, we have contact information and, and ASAP has all their information. And I know you have other speakers. Yeah. Uh, Night. But, you know, if there's any follow up questions, just please feel free to reach out and we can send you that video of what um, uh, what the outreach looks like. I feel like. like you're pimping me out, Ron. I think I think we need a, a like a yeah, a social. <laughs> it's not yeah. that great of a video. A coordinator I want to get the video and the one page mailer. Yeah, we'll send you the mailer and we'll email you the link, link to the video for sure. We'll do it All right. Day. Any we're going to wrap up but any last questions, guys? Well, Michelle and Ron, thank you thank so you. much for um, joining us tonight.
Yeah, thank Thanks you. For having us. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. you know, we always okay. learn so much. So thank you. Okay, you guys are great. Right. And when we're back doing live, we'll get out with you at a live event. <laughs> Love that. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. bye. Okay, so um, we will segue to our next guest speakers. Um, we have three students, um, juniors from Maranek High School. Thank you for joining us, Caitlin Carpenter. Um, and I guess you're with um, uh, Michaela Lochran and Fatima Khan. So thank you for joining us tonight. And um, you're gonna talk about the, um, uh, the Dance Gamer facility that's you're trying to prevent from going online. So I'll just turn it over to you girls. Awesome. I guess we could start with each just introducing ourselves. So I'm Caitlin. I'm Michaela. I'm Fatima and we're all um, juniors at Mamaroneck High School. We're also all part of an organization called Sunrise Westchester Hub, which is a part of a broader movement, Sunrise Movement, which is a movement for a Green New Deal. Um, and so we're coming to you today, though, to talk specifically about preventing um, the um, proposal for a new dance game or fracked gas plant from going through. Um, so to do this, we are advocating for the village to pass a municipal resolution stating official opposition to the proposal. Um, the plant is located in Newburgh, New York, um, and the resolution that we're referring to has been sent in an email um, to the village board, which I believe many of you are copied on. Um, if anybody doesn't have that and wants that, we can send another copy with the resolution right after we finish speaking. Um, so to give a little background, the dance camera plant is situated in Newburgh, New York. It's a 50, 60 year old um, fossil fuel based power plant, natural gas based power plant to be specific, um, that currently runs at about 5% capacity. Um, so there is now a proposal, which we're referring to, to build a new natural gas plant next um, to the existing facility that would run almost constantly. Um, so it's turning a peaker plant into a baseload plant. This new plant would extend New York's reliance on fossil fuels and specifically fracked gas for decades. To elaborate on that fracked gas point, um, the natural gas to be used by the new facility will be supplied by Central Hudson's um, distribution system, and that gas primarily comes from Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, which are all major fracking states. Um, so it is, it is extracted through fracking, and any gas that's not extracted through fracking used by the plant will inherently co-mingle with this fracked gas from these states. Um, yeah. Um, additionally, the plant is set to store up to 1 million gallons of diesel fuel and 30,000 gallons of aqueous ammonia on site. This area is incredibly prone to flooding and was forced to close down for two years after Hurricane Sandy. If it were to flood with these chemicals on site, it would be disastrous for the area's water, hurting both its people and its wildlife. And when burned, this fuel will also continually decrease air quality, increasing risk of asthma attacks, lung cancer, and other air quality caused illnesses. Not to, not to mention it would ruin our state's renewable energy goals as specified in the recently passed Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. This act requires that New York State cut greenhouse gas emissions to 85% below 1990 levels by 2050, a goal that will never be reached if we continue to build new fossil fuel run power plants. So how do we stop this plant? we must convince Governor Cuomo to oppose the proposal. After the two-year review process is over, which will be sometime in the next year, the proposal will land on his desk, and from there, the governor has the power to either approve and sign off on the plan or to stop it entirely. That is why it is crucial that we show Governor Cuomo that his constituents do not want this plan. We also want to show you that there has been um, quite a bit of precedence regarding this issue. Both the town of Mamaroneck and village of Larchmont have passed resolutions against this proposal. And there have been thousands of signatures on petitions and public comments collected on a docket to, against the plant to send to Governor Cuomo. Additionally, the Stop Dance Scammer Coalition, made up of groups such as um, Food and Water Action and Sierra Club, as well as Sunrise Westchester, has put together an anti-Dan scammer elected officials letter to send to Governor Cuomo. The letter was sent in August with over 150 elected official signatures, including the entire Westchester Board, um, the entire Westchester County Board of Legislators. Across the state, 26 municipalities have passed resolutions opposing this plant. Of the 26, seven municipal resolutions have been passed in Westchester, including the town of Mamaroneck, village of Larchmont, Greenberg, Hastings-Don-Hudson, Newcastle, Mount Vernon, and Peatskill. 
The resolution we have sent to you um, is a copy of the resolution passed in both the town of Mamaroneck and the village, which has been edited to be village of Mamaroneck specific. We are working to pass as many of these resolutions as possible to show statewide opposition to the plant and ensure that New York is not reliant on fossil fuels for decades to come. That is why it is crucial for the village to join in this fight by passing a municipal resolution against the Dan Scammer expansion. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. You know, that was a lot of information all at once. What sorts of approvals does the plant have to have in addition to Governor Cuomo's approval? Is it before some board like the New York State Power Authority at this point or, or some other board? It's not under NIPA. Um, there is a siting board um, that is, I believe it is part of the governor's office. Um, so yes, there is a committee and that is the committee that kind of is looking through um, any of the reports that are being sent um, by the um, by Tiger Industries, which is the company pushing for this plant. So any reports that they have um, that are part of that two year review process is sent to that specific siting board. But in the end, we anticipate it will be within Governor Cuomo's um, unless we do a really, really good job, which we might. Um, it will be within Governor Cuomo's um, decision. I would, um, I would like to add something, and I think this is great that you're doing this. Um, when I found out you were going to be on, uh, be guests here tonight, I can you all hear me okay? Okay, I assume everyone's frozen on my screen. I assume you could hear me. Yes. But um, yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, so I did some research because I thought it was great that you were doing this. And uh, you know the research that I did because I think we have the same sites, our information. But I'll tell, I'd like to tell the committee about this because it's a really interesting story. And it all has to do with closing down of Indian Point. I'll keep it a short story. It all has to do with closing Indian Point down. And um, so we're losing a lot of generating power without Indian Point. And to make up for it, we actually have three new fossil fuel uh, gas power plants that are uh, currently going, currently in operation. They just started going. And uh, one of them that I know of really well is up by Dover Plain. Uh, up Route 22, and that's called the Cricket Valley, and you students probably know about it. So the major public interest group that, um, and I sent you all a, a, a link to it, um, maybe Dan, you know, it's the New York, um, I forgot, it's some I group and their public interest group. And they um, said that, that because we have these three other fossil fuel plants, we probably don't need that um, to go online. Probably, but they're not 100% sure, but they said that if there is enough renewable uh, development, renewable fuels development in the works, and there's enough um, uh, careful use of fossil fuels now so that we, can, so that we don't put too much more in the environment, um, that um, and we and we save our energy so we don't use that much gas, then in that case, we should be able to get by without this new power plant. So um, I guess that this is the gas interests that are pushing it more than anything. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, just to Please. clarify a couple of points from there. There has been studies done saying that even with the closing of Indian Point, New York State will be fine in terms of energy for the next 10 years. We also, under the CLCPA, which Michaela mentioned, Climate Leadership and Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, it specifies that 9,000 megawatts of renewable energy, specifically hydropower, needs to be built by 2035. So we're already building plenty. Why would we need, what is this, a, like a 500 megawatt power plant? Why would we need this? Um, and then another point that you mentioned was the interests behind this. This is really for money. So um, the Hudson Valley is a valuable place to build power plants because of our proximity to New York City 
and since the city uses a lot of power, we also, so, and also due to the way that our federal subsidies work, um, industries want to build power plants here to provide power to the city and to the region, since we have a lot of people who use power here. And um, because of federal subsidies, even if the plant runs for only 30 minutes and then it fails, um, the investors in the plant will earn about $45 million um, for the next decade or so, so like per year, um, just because of the way, because of how our federal subsidies work. So just to recap, there's really no need for the plant even with the closing of Indian Point, and the primary reason for the plant is to give people money. Hmm. Very interesting. Believe it. Mark? <clears throat> Great presentation. Thank you for the information. Um, how how does this uh, how does this tie into the new developments with Rikers Island and the plans for a power plant on, on Rikers Island? Because it seems like if we are developing, you just mentioned, you know, because of our proximity to New York City, if that's going to be powering New York City, then I think that's another feather that you can add into this cap of not needing this power plant. <clears throat> Yeah, I actually don't know a lot about, are you referring to a fossil fuel plant on Rikers Island? Because I know there's been talk of making it a solar island. Yeah, they've talked about making it a bunch of different things, either a power plant or a wastewater treatment plant or a bunch of different things. So if, if you know, it hasn't been determined yet what it will be, but um, I think most people are pushing for it to be a wastewater treatment plant that can, that can combine uh, and eliminate some of the other wastewater treatment plants, but it's also been talked about that it could be a power plant too. So just wondering. Yeah, I mean, that also ties in with the CLCPA and the hydropower that we're gonna build. There, there's a plenty of other power projects happening. This one's really unnecessary, would seriously hurt the community. Um, and again, is basically just for profit. Um, yeah, and there's, speaking of, New York City and power plants being built there. There's also proposals to replace the peaker plant there with baseload plants. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening in this area, um, the fossil fuel infrastructure area. Um, yeah, this plant is very unnecessary. Caitlin, have you gone before the um, the board, the village board? Not the village board, no. So the governor, so our mayor hasn't heard your presentation. He hasn't, but we were on an email chain with him that he responded to. Okay. Um, and then we were directed to this meeting. So yeah, yeah. we, I think we need to get on the official village agenda though to pass it, um, a resolution. Well, well, just, you know, Dan Natchez is on this call and he's on the village board. So he's our liaison. So you're doing right. this in the right order. That's that's all good. <clears throat> um, I think, Ellen, if the committee is so, you know, if needs get better informed, fine. If not, uh, if it wants to take a stand on it and recommend it to the board, that would also be helpful. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Is I also did a little bit of research um, just so I knew what the hell you guys were going to talk about <laughs> before this call. Because thank you for bringing this to our attention because this was nowhere on my radar. So um, this is this is great to learn about this. Um, and I just learned a lot. Um, I guess when, when the, um, the clean the Westchester Clean Energy Act went into effect, I guess, in March of 19, um, there was discussion about that they were, that Con Ed was having a natural gas shortage or, or so they were saying, and, you know, that there was going to be, um, sort of a look into what that was and if it was really an issue. And I'm just curious if, if those studies have been done and if there is an issue, it sounds like you think that it's really not an issue and we don't need this plant for any reason other than for profit. So, so if we were so inclined, what would the action item be to pass a resolution having uh, recommending that the village board um, take a stand on this uh, or, or would it be some other action that we could take to advance the ball on this particular well, I, issue? I think first you have to decide whether you think this is correct or not. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it's not, don't misunderstand me, but I think that the procedure would, you have to decide to take a stand. If so, I think it would be helpful if there is a draft resolution for you to review it 
And if you think it should be done to recommend to the Board of Trustees, not only to hear a presentation from uh, these illustrious young, uh, young uh, people, uh, <clears throat> but to uh, recommend adoption of it. It sounds like we're being asked to recommend to the village board that we would be signing on to a resolution against the plan, against the Yeah, I, I, but I think you need to, the plan. I, think, I think you need to have something, you know, something written out. So, okay. so Ellen, so Ellen, what, what I'd suggest is that somebody prepare a resolution that we can take up at our next meeting, since we don't have anything written and we want it, whatever we want, whatever we do, we want to have it articulate and, and well reasoned. Um, well, I think that Caitlin had already, you have something written, right? Yeah, you, you, yeah. You've, you've indicated that both the town and uh, the town of Marnick and the village of, Mar 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 of sorry, the village of Larchman have already passed something. So there should be a form resolution that can be adopted, or, I'm sorry, adapted to the village of Marnick. Yes, we, we've already done that. We forwarded it in an email a while ago. I can re-forward it right now. Yeah, I believe I've, I have forwarded it out to the committee. So I think that um, it's really about us deciding whether that we're... Um, Alan. That we want to take a stand against the plant or we don't. Yes? I'm sorry, Alan. Was that the, um, the letter to the legislators that you sent this afternoon? asking us to read before the meeting. Um, that was part of the email that um, Caitlin had sent me, but no, I think there was something separate that you were. Okay. Yeah, but Caitlin, you're not talking about the letter that was signed by all the different legislators. Is that, is that the letter you're talking about? No, this is, so in the original email I sent you, there were five attachments. One of those was the one that was signed by all the county legislators. And then one of them, it's the only word doc on there. Okay. Um, I can re I can like resend an email right now to you if you want to just pop, like uh, Bill. Sure. Bill Wong, um, do you have any information on this? Is this on your radar at all? Um, I don't have any information on it. Uh, planning staff, we can look into it tomorrow and um, and you know and get back to you. So yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think Caitlin, if you if you could, I think you would be wise to uh, get information back to Ellen to circulate to the committee and to uh, Bill uh, so that uh, he can you know, get up to speed, because uh, I'm sure that would be a question that would be addressed to you by the board. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you, yes. So, um, you know, in this way, you have more power behind the request to the board, you know, to move, you know, to take action on it. It's just not a requirement, but for me, that's what I would be doing. So it sounds like we need to wait until the next meeting before we can vote to send it forward to the um, Board of Trustees. I would agree with Caitlin, that. what is the timing from, you, from your standpoint? Um, we would appreciate this like as soon as possible. We technically like by the end of the year would be very nice. I just re-forwarded all of you the draft resolution if you got that notification. I mean, I'm really not sure if people, not to put anyone on the spot, but if we're in, you know, in favor of this, why we wouldn't just take up a vote right now? I'm happy to do that. I know, I know something about this anyway, so. I mean, I read the materials from Caitlin. I'm sorry, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but certainly on face value, it seems like something that I would support. I wanted to ask a question though. Um, Newburgh is in Orange County. And so I'm just curious, what is this? Is it an issue that that power is being delivered to our municipality or so why are we in Westchester being asked to weigh in on something that's in a separate area? Because this ultimately is in the hands of the state. And so the state needs to know that, you know, the state as a whole wants to move off of these power plants. Additionally, like we all share one atmosphere. Um, and if Westchester particularly, we have a lot of weight as a county in the state. Um, and if we're looking to pass a Westchester wide uh, municipal resolution, which we are currently working towards, um, getting as many municipalities within Westchester um, really helps us in that effort. And looking even bigger picture, 
if Westchester passes a resolution as a county, other counties around like Ulster um, might, and then that at uh, Rockland, and those are really important pieces um, in this advocacy. So Caitlin, we use, uh, did you say earlier that uh, George Latimer and the county board had already signed on to this? It's not a resolution. They signed on to a letter opposing the plant. So they are officially opposing the plant. The county resolution is itself is a whole other issue that we're working towards right now. Um, but just so you're aware that this is like Village of Marinick plays a very important part in moving Westchester County. Westchester County plays a very important part in moving the state. Yeah. So you 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 want the village to join the critical mass putting pressure on the county and ultimately on the governor. Yeah. I mean, you said, did you say Catherine Parker signed off on it? All 17 legislators have. Could I make a re uh, request? Since, yep. since some of us really haven't had a chance to look at all these materials, I think it would be better if we put this on the agenda for the next meeting and we all did our homework and then voted after, after you know, being fully informed. I think I know how I'm going to vote, but I'd like to actually have a chance to look at the materials first. Okay. Huh? So, um, Caitlin, that would be... Um, I, Caitlin, this is Dan. Uh, your resolution should change Congressman Elliot Engel. Because he, as of, uh, as of um, January, he will not be the congressman. Yes, we were... Would you like the next congressman to be listed there instead? Well, you can say Congressman Elliot Engel and Congressman elect, you know, I just think you need, you need to update what you got here, you know, in terms of <clears throat> things that would not necessarily be correct. That's all. I just was reading your resolution that you were kind enough to forward to me. Will do. Okay. Well, does anybody else have any more questions? All right, well, thank you so much for bringing this um, matter before our committee. Um, you really, I think, um, I know you educated me and uh, we will seriously consider this resolution. Um, our next meeting is the third Tuesday of November. Um, and then we'll be back in touch after that. Is that okay? So if you vote on in the third Tuesday in November, it will be on the uh, second meeting of the uh, Board of Trustees November meeting. That will get us before the end of the year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right in there. When would, when would the meeting be? Ours is it the 17th and then the trustees is when? Uh, it's the following. I just don't have the date in front of me. Mm -hmm. The following. Uh, and, and there's a holiday in there. So it may, it's, I don't know which date, but I can. I, mm -hmm. 26 is the holiday thanksgiving 26. no i know but it's uh, the village does all sorts of things with calendars when there are holidays so just wait a minute and i'll tell you i believe it's uh november 23rd the monday 23rd okay good all right well thank you thank you so much thank you, thank you. i think they love appreciate it thank you oh okay night. You're welcome to stay, but I'm sure you have other things to do. <laughs> Thanks for all your hard work. Yes. Yeah, good job. Got it. Thank Keep you. Keep up the good work. Bye. Um, so just two last things, guys, and then um, we can wrap up. One, just to skip to what we usually do first. I don't want to lose sight of um, approving the minutes for September. So um, if we can get a motion for that. So move. Second. 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 Did I get a second? And yeah. second. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. So um, we have a motion to approve our minutes. Thank you. And thank you, Renee, for doing our minutes. Well, everybody so, well, need to have a vote, Ellen. I'm sorry? You need to have people. Have I thought we just need to have a first and a second, and then that's it. No? No, it's first, second, then you vote. So, okay. yeah. Okay, so all vote to approve the minutes for September. Aye. Great. 
Aye. Aye, 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 aye. Okay, I think. Aye, aye, aye. Okay, we good? All right. Um, so the last thing that we need to take up, and this is also sort of a time critical matter, is um, the Sustainability Collaborative from the town of Maranek. Um, they've been focused for a, a while on, um, you know, safe routes to school um, for kids to bicycle to school. And they saw COVID as, you know, a time that people actually were biking more and more, which I'm certainly seeing. And I guess there's some, um, a New York State DOT COVID-19 variants that is allowing some municipalities to sort of fast track and do some interim um, safe routes for bicycles, which I think is interesting. And they want to take advantage of this and use this sort of interim period to sort of study how it's working and get feedback from residents and so forth. Um, I did send, I hope everybody had a chance to look at it. I did send a PowerPoint presentation, which sort of illustrated what this would look like. Because frankly, as someone who drives up and down Boston Post Road multiple times a day, I was really struggling with what this would be. Um, so the ask is that they want the village of Amaranek to write a letter of support to go forward with this interim, you know, variants or whatever you want to call it to have these safe routes and there'll be a study and then at some point I think the study's four thousand dollars they want there to be a cost sharing with the town and then the village of Larchmont. Um, so uh, I don't want to give my opinion on this I just want to open it up for discussion of if people had a chance to look at it what you thought um, because it's really important to see the visual of what the, what Boston Post Road would look like with the bike lanes. So I'm hoping everybody, if you didn't look at it, maybe while we're on the call now, you could sort of open your file and, and take a look at it. If you have so Ellen, Ellen is the request. Share your screen with it. David, hi, yeah. It is a request for us to support a study or a request to support having bike lanes? Obviously they're two different questions. Um, the request, the immediate request is to, um, go forward with this with this interim bike lane proposal. And by interim, I mean that rather than making permanent structural change, like you see, for example, in New York City, uh, there's the permanent bike lanes, but you know, that cordoned off. This would be done more through like cones. Actually, there's something they called it, um, oh my God, I'm having a brain freeze. I think Jersey barriers, I think they're called, like there are those big orange things that, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, you those know, are called Jersey, Jersey barriers. Yes. Okay. So then you would have these barriers that would create um, a bike lane. So in between the sidewalk on Boston Post Road, then there would be a bike lane. And then you'd have a lane of traffic going in one direction. On the other side, you'd have another lane going the other way, another bike lane, and then the sidewalk. So it would basically take Boston Post Road from a two lane highway or road or whatever to a one lane, but then there'll be a middle lane where you make left turns out of. So it's a little confusing for me. And I do worry about safety issues. I mean, I'm all for biking, getting people out of their cars. And I think that, um, I know a bunch of you don't have kids in the school system anymore, but you may be aware that, you know, the schools are a half day right now. So there's a lot more going to and from schools than there even was before because kids are either going in the morning or the afternoon. So, a lot of you know a lot of parents aren't around to be doing all this driving we don't have school buses so there are a lot of kids are riding their bicycle yes martin so uh, i i did look through this and and i have a lot of concerns around it actually and and i don't know even know what the 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 uh, the survey would do that would change my mind really because if you look at even areas such as, you know, right here at the corner where Boston Post Road meets Mamaroneck Avenue, you know, there's no sidewalk on the other side of Boston Post Road at that bridge there where Brewers is and all that kind of stuff where the, where the entrance to the park is. <clears throat> and that's a very dangerous <clears throat> place for pedestrians, let alone bikers. Um, so I don't know, I know that there are plans in the works to tear that bridge down and 
and build a new bridge, but that's way off in the future. It's so, not that far off in the future. It's this, it's this coming year. Uh, okay, well, that that's good news to know. Hopefully, uh, all the traffic isn't going to be coming down Spruce Street. Hopefully, you guys are, are creating we, a plan we, around that. We, we negotiated to keep the bridge open, even though it will be a reduced lanes. Okay, good. Uh, but but that that's just that's just one that's just one particular area. The other. No, I just I just you know wanted to update everybody. That's all. No, no, I, I appreciate that. And, so and the, I, that's, I, that's share, I share your concerns that, that, for the, that. That's in mind for me. So the, the other the other area is uh, right in front of the wastewater treatment plant and the park. Um, you know where where that turn comes around right after the BMW dealership. Uh, you know that that's a very tight turn and. I don't know how I don't know how they would make that navigable for bikes and cars. So that's my two cents. I'm sorry, which turn are you talking about? Turning onto Fenham or mm -hmm. Maronick Avenue? No, no. It's it, if you if you're traveling down Boston Post Road past the past the wastewater treatment plant, going south, um, and there, and there's that little dog leg that happens. I'm sorry. Are you traveling you're north? Right, you're talking about right past Mount Pleasant. Yeah, right past the church. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the turn onto Mount Pleasant, you're saying? No, not turning onto Mount Pleasant. On it's it's on Boston Post Road itself. It makes a little, it makes a little, it makes a little dog leg. Right. And you know, if you're driving towards Larchmont from Maranick Avenue and you're driving along, you hit the you hit the church. As soon as you get to the end of the church where Mount Pleasant Avenue is, Boston Post Road makes a little dog leg. It just it butts to the right a little bit. It doesn't go straight. It butts a little bit to the right, and the, and the road gets narrower. <clears throat> okay. Right by the BMW dealer, right? Right by the BMW dealership, exactly. And okay. whenever you're driving actually the other way from like Larchmont to Boston Post Road, people always always cut that lane, always cut the cut the lanes when they're when they're coming around that turn. <clears throat> Ellen, is there were they going to eliminate parking on the uh, Post Road? Is that how they're no. going? They're not talking about eliminating parking. So that really makes it narrow. I know. I mean, honestly, I have my own safety concerns. And I, I think it's um, a tall order because you're right. It's you have pedestrians, you park cars. Um, and I think that there's so much traffic during the day. And especially, as I said, because there's now multiple school times with people coming back and forth that I think just having one lane of traffic in each direction could be could be difficult. Um, yeah, if, if they were widening Boston Post Road, uh, yeah. I'd be all for it. It'd be, you know, it'd be great. I think it'd be a great addition, but that's not what they're doing. So, yeah. Right. Well, Ellen, if you, I'm yeah. sorry. Ellen, um, you know, since you go up and down Boston Post Road, you know that we really need those four lanes right now because think about the summertime as you're passing Harbor Island. Or and this is long range, or the um, or in the spring when the sports start, people are parking, they're pulling out, and if you only have one lane of traffic going by there, then there are going to be tremendous traffic delays. It's going to really slow down traffic. I David, That's I have the same the exact other. concern that when somebody is parking, you can't go around them. I had the same right. thought. Yeah. Right, and and it and then it's even more because you know. Uh, they gave us this plan, this parking plan, and it's the same as in Manhattan, where you have cars that are moved away from the curb, and between the parked cars and the sidewalk, that's where the bike lanes would be. And so this really creates a lot of congestion, a lot of possibilities, a lot of prob uh, problems here, possibilities of problems, because if you have those barriers, then people have to park away from the barrier so passengers can open their doors because you're gonna have a very tight fit there for a bike lane on either side. Um, and, you know, I, the thing that, I, that bothers, me the mo bothers me more is that they want an immediate answer. And like they said, they have to do this in two weeks, there's a deadline. And, you know, I'm thinking this is like major. I mean, the community would just be, I know if there's a traffic slowdown, especially near Christmas, but this community is really gonna be up in arms if there's, if all of a sudden we just start cutting, cutting down on traffic lanes. I mean, I've seen that happen. Um, I used to drive four days a week down Queens Boulevard after de Blasio did it. And it really made a problem with um, traffic. Although, I mean, people adjusted, but um, 
the same, we'd have issues here. So I don't think we should just like plow ahead on this really, really fast. I know that there's a deadline, but they're throwing us their deadline. And I, th I could see it really running into problems, safety problems, like one said, with all sorts of different. Yeah, I, I agree, David, because we have, we have enough traffic the way it is now that I actually avoid Boston Post Road many times and drive down, down Palmer because Boston Post Road is, it gets crazy, you know, during rush hour and things like that. So, and I'm sure a lot of residents do that now and it'll get, and it'll get, it'll basically congest all the ancillary roads because all the people will stop using Boston Post Road. And that'll there really, go. That'll, that'll really make residents upset. Is there a, an alternative route for the bike to school? Like, that, that was going to be my question was, is this study just looking at Boston Post Road and converting part of Boston Post Road to bike lanes? Or would it also look for other bike, more bike friendly routes through the neighborhood? Because I think, you know, having lived in Brooklyn for so long, the thing that made bike lanes work there was that they were very strategic in picking streets that could handle bike traffic without affecting, you know, you're not going down Flatbush Ave you know, with like dump trucks and, and, and heavy machinery, you're picking the side roads, you know, it might be a more circuitous route, but it's safer. And it happens to be a lot more pleasant on a bike also, <laughs> um, you know, to cut through a neighborhood rather than go, you know, down a major throughway. Yeah, like Prospect is wide enough that that could accommodate a bike lane, uh, you know, along the right side of it and still have parking on the, on the other side of it. So, you know, and that goes halfway through the village and then it could come around to Tompkins and, you know, they could go up top. Tompkins is also wide enough that it could accommodate a bike lane. And really this would be used for the middle school and high school. And I can't see them going on the Boston Post Road. They always take the interior roads. Nobody goes, how many right. kids do you see that live in the village of Mamaroneck going on Boston Post Road to get to the high school? They're on Palmer, they're on Prospect, they're right. on all the interior roads. Right. That's you a good point. Sense. I mean, I look, I feel this way too. I feel like this is a bit of a cram job for us and it just felt like a little, and I tried to get hold of Mitch yesterday because I wanted him to come actually present to you guys because I don't, I don't feel equipped to really fully you know, present this in a way that he would, um, but he didn't respond to me. And um, I reached out to him early yesterday. So I guess that was a bit last minute, but he didn't respond at all. Um, I, I find it a strange time of year to be doing this, frankly. Like I would think if you're gonna pilot this, maybe you would have done it like in August when less people are around and the weather's really warm. Yeah, or um, in the spring. Right. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the other part of the equation is, and somebody's mentioned it uh, before, is that there may be other roads that are more suited to bike lanes. And part of the strategic plan that we've all been working on and waiting for is to make the village a more bike friendly village. But it seems to me that we should do it in a more thoughtful way and, and try to, to, to make the right choices as to which roads become you know more bike friendly and and doing this on an ad hoc basis just because there's a specific opportunity to make one road a bike a, a, a more bike friendly road may not be the the sensible way of approaching this issue i second that okay well i think that um we're mostly of a like mind here so I'll, I'll just relay that we're just not comfortable um, back to the collab. And, um, well, <clears throat> go ahead, Kristen. I think I would love more than anything to continue to promote the idea of bike riding because I, I don't want to be naive and think that having bike lanes is going to reduce traffic on Boston Post, but I can't tell you how important it is that kids have safe places and ways to get to school. So if there's a way that we could support and encourage alternatives to the main thoroughfare and not just say this doesn't work, but we support this on a broader spectrum with a full study. And, and I think what they're trying to do is to interconnectivity between the villages and the towns. And I think that that's also very relevant because if I could, I know I can bike to New Rochelle and I've done it, but it's dangerous. 
Um, and if I had a better way to do it, then I'd be more apt to do it. I had to go there today and I didn't need my car, but I would have liked to have, you know, would have been a great way to get some exercise at 70 degrees. Sure. So I just think that without just saying thanks, no thanks, um, I'd love to say we, we support this. Um, I don't know how traffic and safety maybe should be involved with this because they've hopefully done more studies like this. And, you know, we're endorsing the idea of bicycling as the you know, committee for the environment. Like, I think biking, we can give a thumbs up to. Right. It's not our place to say this road or that road, but maybe we can still endorse it in a way that says, please, more bike lanes. Let's think about it. Let's make a good plan. Right. Yeah. We, it's, it's not that we, we don't support the idea of bike lanes. I'm with, I'm with you, Christy. It's the, it's the idea that David sort of laid out and that I've sort of been talking about, too, is that if this, I guess the question back to them would be, will this study cover a thorough examination of alternate routes other than Boston Post Road? So we support the idea of bike lanes, but we, but we feel that Boston Post Road isn't the ideal candidate for a bike lane. And we would well, we're not the ones to tell you where to go. I mean, right. as a committee for the environment, I think we can endorse bike riding. Yes. Yeah, that's a given. Yeah. Yes, but if the question at hand is whether or not this plan will work or not work, um, I am of the mind that it won't on Boston Post Road, but it could work on other ancillary roads. And if we were to participate in a study that would evaluate the village as a whole and set out a plan of what the best bike lane would be or best alternative bike lanes would be, I'd be all for that. I'd say, yeah, let's spend the money. If they're going to look at the entire village and figure out what the best routes would be and give us three alternatives of what the best routes would be, I, you got my support 100%. <clears throat> but that's not what this is doing. It's just looking uh -huh. at Boston Post Road and that's it. Well, this is, it, I mean, it's really, no, no, like, if you're, if you're on Chatsworth Avenue, if you're, or if you're on, I think, Fenimore, you could see the showers, you know, the painted lines that are intended, which I don't think most people even understand what those are, but intended for bikers and drivers to share. It's their shared resource. This, yep. is, um, this is entirely different, because this is reconfiguring Boston Post Road. Right. The, re the reason this comes up now, I think, is it's a state program. Boston Post Road is a state road. Yeah. And that's why it's being Good done point. in a completely yeah. ad hoc way. But that doesn't mean that we have to do it in that in an ad hoc way. If, if so, we think there's a more um, thoughtful and, and comprehensive way of making the village more bike friendly. Okay. Uh, uh, no, you've hit the nail there, David. I think you've hit the nail there. To complicate the heard. issue. Um, one is you would have to. You, the committee doesn't have the authority to commit the village, only the village board does for, you know, to, to be part of a study. Uh, second, uh, you, the traffic commission should be involved, would have to be involved in it. And this is something that you guys would want to work with them on or uh, to be more bike friendly. Uh, uh, so I just throw that out there. So conceptually, you can, you know, you can say, you know, that we think these are great ideas or whatever, or they're bad ideas or whatever, uh, but you can, you would not be able to sign on to say, commit the village to be part of a study. Yeah, we have no authority. That, that, that's no, I just, I don't, didn't know if anybody understood that. Yeah, this is just, I, just, a, I, don't think we just voice an opinion. I think he was looking just for a letter of support. Is that, which we're not even, agreeing to do that, but that's what he was looking for. And to look at a bigger picture, um, we have we do have bike lanes right now. They're called sidewalks. And no one's even talking about bringing the concept of sidewalks into this picture because that's we have sidewalks on both sides. I'm just saying that there's a whole other area of discussion that could come into this concept that we haven't even mentioned. Well, you're not supposed to ride your bike on the side. Yeah, I'm not sure I follow you, I don't know where No, actually, actually, the restriction is only on Mimaranek Avenue. It's not supposed to, but it, it, in the village code, it's Mimaranek Avenue you can't. But um, there's no restriction on sidewalks throughout the rest of the village. Yeah, hmm. I, I hear you, David. But as a biker, you generally want to stay off. No, I understand. But if you're a kid going to school, 
on a little bike, they, you know, they use the sidewalks. And I'm just saying, we have sidewalks that could be brought into this conversation about how to allocate the space for the best use. That's all. I think we're all saying the same thing, which is this deserves further study in a more comprehensive way. And exactly. maybe that's, that's the way we re respond to Mitch, that we, we're, we're really in favor of bicycling. We're in favor of making the village and the town more bike friendly. We're not prepared to do take this particular step at this time because we don't think it's necessarily the, the best way of doing it. David, exactly. do you know if, if that's part of the comprehensive plan, I, I know you brought it up earlier, but is it is it is there a study for bikes for biking in the village part of the comprehensive plan? The comprehensive plan talks about making the village more bike friendly as one of the main initiatives, but I don't think it poses a, a specific study. Okay. At least not the last draft I saw. Thank you. All right, well, I think that concludes our agenda. Um, well, I, I did have one other thing. Let's see, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Could I just throw in one more piece of information? Of course, go right ahead. Um, just a heads up, um, and I'll talk to, to Robert about hopefully distributing this information. The Rise Sustainability Group is having a cleanup and they're doing it in various areas around Rye, Rye Brook, Rye City, you know, and the village. I mean, they're, they, they have about four points where they're trying to organize this and it's, you know, go out and, and, and clean up. And uh, I'll just try to, it'll be for Saturday, November 7th. Um, the reason they had, they had come to me for a quote unquote Rye Neck, which I don't really represent. And as a village of Ameritech, it was, um, I mean, they only came with this date about two weeks ago. So it's not really been something that we could plan for or organize. Um, but I just want to try to get the word out there that that Rye as a community, the sustainability is having a cleanup on Saturday, November 7th from nine to 11. And if, if it's okay that I, once I get the flyers that, you know, have the locations and the times forwarded to Robert, can he distribute it to um, all the social media things that he does? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Great. I have one last thing as, as well. Um, David and myself, I think, are about to expire from this committee. Um, I think December is, is our is our is our expiration date. True that. Huh? True that. <laughs> so I just wanted, you know, I just want to say it's been great working with you guys and uh, I look forward to what you guys are going to be doing in the future. Um, but it's, it's been a great, you know, four years or so. Um, and, uh, I don't know if you, you noticed that there's actually a, uh, I saw it when I went on the website, the village website today, that there's supposed to be a, a fair for new committee members coming up. So, um, I think it's two weeks from now. So it said something about, you know, talk to the chair of the committee. So I don't know if Alan, if you've seen that or not, or anybody's reached out. Oh, oh yeah. I, I'm aware of it last year we had an in-person fair. Yeah, they're doing all... a virtual one this year. Yeah, so this year it's virtual. Um, hopefully people will show up, but yes, I am aware of it. It is, um, it's on November 4th. Martin, aren't we here till November or are we done on, after November? Done generally, generally the way that it's run in the past is uh, November is, is the last meeting for people because we've actually expired. Once December hits, we're done. So, and our so, meeting doesn't happen until the second week or in December, so. So fo following up on your comment, Martin, are you and David, uh, is this your first term or second term on the committee? Second term. My second term. My second so term. I am, well. I am done for the next whatever term. How, I can't, many, I years can't that? That How many years, years is that? How many years is that? Six years. Six years. Yeah, I said four, but you know, I was cutting it short. Yeah, <laughs> felt like four years, but it was six years. Yeah. <laughs> So years. you'll be gone a year and then come back on. I don't know how that works, but I think you, you have to be you, you have to be gone for at least a year and then you're eligible. And then you can come back on to that committee. Yeah, I'm I mean, going to other committees. It's pretty full with the Harbor Zone Coastal Commission. I'm on that now, so oh. as well. Yeah. That, that, so you will be at the November meeting, or you won't? I will be at the November meeting. Okay, good. All right, so we'll yeah, say it'll, be, it'll be our it'll be our last meeting. Okay, we'll have a little cake. Oh, a virtual <laughs> cake. Um. <laughs> 
I just wanted to say one thing also, because we talked about this and now we have to put it on the agenda. We need a, a someone on the committee that's in charge of the social media. You see how Michelle does all that? Yeah. I think we should put that on because if you don't have a person who's it's and I know Robert puts it on all the village sites and all that, but you need a person who's developing it on mm -hmm. their social media. Yeah, somebody who's doing that research that she was talking about where they're looking into all the groups and they're trolling the groups to find out. You right. Know. You're, you know, you're adding on groups, you're liking groups, you know, you're joining groups. They're looking at your thing. So it's got to be that's that's something we have to talk about. And the two events per what did she say? Per month? Per month. We yeah. have to we have to do that. We're talking and it's not getting done. I'm happy to volunteer, but we've got well, to make a plan. Well, Maria, well, I, think you, I think you as the real estate person, you got to start giving away those kids. I think I just got to buy them and give them away. As <laughs> I'm going to just go broke. <laughs> Maria, it's funny that I, I don't think, think I wasn't thinking about it. <laughs> one of the ideas that I think is immediately actionable is to... Um, have a presence outside of one of the apartment buildings, whether it's um, you know the Avalon or the Regatta or the Mason, um, and just engage with residents as they're coming in and out. It just has to be targeted a different one every time. Maybe uh, what's her name, Mackenzie? Yeah, she would and be great. like yeah, I would you know partner up with her and organize something and just do different locations and just kind of you know, spearheaded. We have to get something going. Yeah, I 100% agree. We keep talking, we gotta put it, we gotta put it together. Yeah, yep. I know. I'm and muted, but the, I started trying to chip away at that a little bit over the last uh, couple of weeks since our last meeting, talking to Robert and trying to at least formulate an idea of how I could start, start taking some of that on, um, so. It's, I'm definitely interested in doing that. I'm trying to work on it. I'm just trying to figure out the lay of the land first about how it works, what officially this committee can promote and can't promote, how it can communicate on behalf of the village and how it can't. So that was some of the stuff that I was talking to the, um, to Robert and others about. You mean uh, for the social media? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. all tied into that. Like the yeah. Facebook page, who owns it? There is a website, but who, you know, okay, you know. Yeah, but I think that Robert's got a handle on that. What Michelle does, it's her own Facebook page. And so she just keeps promoting it and joining mm -hmm. groups and then other groups see her post. It's a personal thing. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. You know, it's not, Robert's got the village covered in those sites. It's someone taking their own page and just, just keep posting and, it keeps getting reshared and really building that community around the food scrap program. Right. She's, I don't think she's speaking in the capacity of, of the, of Scarsdale. She's speaking as herself, but sharing all the stuff that happens. Like, yeah. As, yeah. This yeah. happened. We right. did this, you know, just, just posting. I mean, I try to do it sometimes on mine, but it's very sporadic, but I do try to post something. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I was talking to you about, Tim, in those emails that, you know, we, we sent back and forth is that, you know, way back when, and David, David Steyer will remember this, is that we talked about having our own website and the whole thing and blah, blah, blah. And I went out and I, I actually still own vomenvironment.com and we could build something and it would be great and it would be awesome. But then we got shut down because the village didn't want us saying anything or being like a voice of the village or whatever and blah 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 so it's a tricky wicket because you got to sort of you know slice and dice and, and figure figure the path without with the path of least resistance so yeah but it's more like a like a spokesperson that like you're talking about maria that's like it's uh yeah not an official capacity but advocating are you are you ready to be the face of the committee for the environment? I, mean, come on. I gotta update my Facebook page if that's gonna be me. I yeah. Go back and delete all the photos from college. I drive right, right, exactly, through exactly. Facebook. I don't you could start a new page. Yeah. You could start a new page, like a new group, a new page. There you go. Are you uh, <laughs> on the Maronic Moms and Dads? Tim? I am. Yeah, I'm all Rynek. I'm in the Rynek Moms and Dads group. Okay. Yeah. I'm not actually getting that. I mean, what I've tried to do is whenever I see that there is any kind of thread like on next door having to do with any topic 
environmentally, I try to chime in and spread our message. So that's just how I've done it. I don't have a huge social media presence of my own. Um, I mean, maybe I could develop it, but I don't have that. Alan, do, do you know somebody called William Kane? William K. Kane, C-A-I-N. I see, you mean Walter Kane? No, William. No. Because I, I responded to something about leaf blowers on uh, next door. Okay. And he sent me an invite to leaf blowers to ban or not to ban. Yeah, and I think I joined that too. Yeah, I, th I think he's with um, uh, with uh, Stuart Hot Dog with the Hot Dogs. Walters Hot Dogs. Yeah, I think he's with Walters. What did I say? Stuart. Sorry. Yeah, I think his name was Walter Kane. Yeah, I see him a lot on next door. Yeah. yeah. He's, no, it's William, I think. But it, it I mean, is William. He oh. lives in Walters. Yeah, I think it's his district. Yeah. His neighborhood's Walters. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'm that's what's confusing me. Okay. Yeah, he was on okay. the ad hoc communications committee for a while too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I just didn't want to join and find I uh, <laughs> put my foot in it. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't really leaf blowers they were talking about. <clears throat> well, right. you know, the conversation about leaf blowers did migrate. <laughs> they all seem to devolve after a while. <laughs> yeah. And everything gets back to Trump. Um, and well, we, got, we, we, really got two weeks, we got two weeks to go. Everybody vote. Vote, yes. Um, and we really should make a push for the food scrap because Thanksgiving's coming up. So we should think of something to really get it out there so people go and, you know, well, actually, the one thing um, Robert is doing is he's putting out messages about pumpkins, about conflict right. with pumpkins after Halloween, which I think is, is nice. Right. But yeah, I think um, I, I found hearing from Michelle and Ron very um, just sort of motivating. So um, I'm going to be, I hope everybody just does a lot of thinking in the next few days. And let's try to maybe not wait to the next meeting and try to think of something that we could just take action on, like even if it's just one thing. Well, could we... Um... Could we just try a outside the recycling center on a Saturday morning? Yeah, I think we should do that. Sure. When I'm uh, I'm willing to do that. I the first thing I ever did was selling these at the um, farmers market about a week before the curfew. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, Dan, is the is the recycling center open on Saturdays again? It is now. It is. Yeah. It wasn't, but it is. And maybe we can get Mackenzie involved. She would love to be. She's so I know. She's, she's so yeah. I feel bad because she really wants to, and it kind of got shut she's down. Really, so. um, well, I'm not around. This, I mean, Lynn, you want to do it um, October 31st, Halloween Day? Sure. Yeah. Let's Absolutely. just make a date, and we I'll contact Tony. Um, we can loop in um, the pumpkins. Yeah. Okay. I think it'll be too soon for the, for for the pumpkins. The, for the pumpkins, but we can get something. And I, we can split up the hours and have McKinsey do it. Let's get on an email. Unless you want to do it the following week, November 7th. Let's just start on the, th let's just start. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll reach out to Tony. Even if we each take like an hour each, whatever, two hours each. Well, and they, and they should have, you shouldn't have to bring anything because they should have all no, the it's right there. stuff right there. In, yeah, they'll in just. The office, in the office across the street. Right. I mean, they'll have to leave, the office is closed, so they'll have to leave it like somewhere <laughs> where we have access to it. Do we, do you think we would do it on the corner, like the corner of Fayette and, and um, no. Benamore? No, at the recycling. See, so oh, inside. Yeah. People are out of the cars and... You know, even if we get them to buy one for a friend, can you buy one? Which Could you get one friend? Even if they're already doing it or if they have a bin, maybe they're doing it, they don't have a bin. But just, you know, start somewhere. Okay. All right, well, we're getting to the end of our meeting, but um, okay. everyone seems energized. This is great, I love it. <laughs> um, all right, well, um, any last, last comment? Nope. Need a motion to close. 
I know, Dan, I'm getting there. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I just was it giving people the last time, Ellen, chance if they wanted a final comment. Okay, yeah, cranky. <laughs> it's like Dan's, got, Dan's been given a, a memo about meeting. It's really uh, <laughs> keeping me in my and keeping me in line. Okay, so motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Vote. 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 Aye. Yay. Yes, I. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a nice night, everyone. Thank you. Thank so you. So long. Good night. Bye. Bye.